Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Home of Christ Church. I am glad to be here, especially today uh, as we celebrate communion. Uh, even though we are all uh, far away from one another, we are still able to remember together as a church family uh, that we are one uh, large church family. So uh, before we, uh, as we continue, as we begin in today's worship, a couple things I wanted to um, just remind us as we prepare to um, worship God, uh, you know, keep on praying for uh, Dave and his family as he has transitioned back to being at home. We praise God for that, but pray for speedy recovery for him and, and just strength for the family as they deal with that. And also pray for uh, Tim Carlson, uh, Tim and Stacy uh, Carlson. Tim is having uh, surgery on his shoulder this week, so pray for a successful procedure. Uh, let me let me pray for us, and then we will get uh, we will continue to worship in music, okay? Heavenly Father, God, we are so grateful that you allow us to be here to worship you. You allow us to recognize that you are God and that uh, you are great and you are wonderful. And as we uh, continue to sing your praises, Lord, would you just direct our thoughts and our heart towards how wonderful and how great you are. Uh, we lift up this time of worship to you, may be glorifying to you, may be a blessing to you. And would your spirit minister to us during this time as well? We pray these things in your son's name. Amen. Oh, 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 oh,
glory in my Redeemer, whose priceless blood has ransomed me. Mine was the sin that drove the bitter nails and hung him on that judgment tree. I will glory in my Redeemer who crushed the power of sin and death. My only Savior before the Holy Judge, Lamb who is my righteousness, the Lamb who is my righteousness. glory in my Redeemer. My life He bought, my love He owns. I have no longings for another. I'm satisfied in Him alone. I will glory in my Redeemer, His faithfulness, my standing place. The foes are mighty and rush upon me. My feet are firm held by His grace. My feet are firm held by His grace. I will glory in my redeeming carries me on eagle's wings. He crowns my life with loving kindness. His triumph song that I'll never see. I will glory in my Redeemer who waits for me at gates of gold. And when he calls me, it will be paradise. His face forever to behold. His face forever to Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, before we go into today's message, a couple more announcements that I just want to highlight. If you have not yet had a chance to download the notes for today's message, uh, please do so. Uh, in the notes, there are some discussion questions if you're going through the sermons with your small group, uh, even some other questions for you to study further as you look at this passage. Uh, just a reminder, uh, today also we will be taking communion uh, together. And so um, we don't know how much longer we'll be doing this, but uh, even as we are far away from one another, just the, the practice of taking communion reminds us that we are drawn together by common union that we have in Christ. So make sure you have your elements ready. Uh, we'll do that at the end of the message. Uh, this After this service, uh, just for, for all the other Sunday schools, uh, we will still have a regular Sunday school class, except for the adult and high school junior and senior class. And so we're just taking a break uh, over this holiday weekend. And finally, if you have not yet had a chance to uh, begin a Love This Book, we've been going through this whole um, Love This Book series through this the course of this year. And we've started part three a couple weeks ago. Some people have asked me, you know, why are we, why are we going through scripture? Why are we going through so much scripture? It seems like uh, every week there's a lot of reading to do. And, and really there is, but uh, there's a couple of reasons we're doing that. First of all, we as a church absolutely believe in the power and the authority of scripture. And so we believe as Christians, it is our calling, our duty, our responsibility to know and to love God through knowing and loving his word. Uh, but part of the reason we're going through all of scripture like this is it gives us a flow of what God is trying to say uh, through all of scripture. Instead of just looking at one particular passage for a very extended period of time, which we still can do on our own, uh, we just want as a church to, to get the over, 
overarching story of what God is doing. So if you have not yet started, we encourage you. We're in Love This Book Part 3. And this week, we're uh, starting in week 27, uh, and we're looking at the life of Jesus Christ. Last week, we looked at a miracle of his. Week before, we looked at uh, really Christmas. Uh, and so we're going to continue on in our Love This Book series, part three. And so today's uh, message comes from what we will be reading this week. So let me pray, and then we will continue on in the sermon part of this worship service. So will you pray with me again? Heavenly Father, God, uh, once again, we come to you. We ask, Lord, that you would open our ears, open our hearts. Uh, the passage we're going to read uh, can be challenging for many of us, myself included. And so, God, I pray that your spirit would just be very clear. Would you remove any distractions, whether it's physical or spiritual, uh, so that your word could take root deeply in our hearts? And would you transform us to be more and more like your son, Jesus Christ? We pray these things in your son's name. Amen. Well, uh, I, I'm going to confess right off the bat, I enjoy watching a certain type of TV show. Uh, and one show that I really enjoy is called The Titan Games. Uh, I don't know if many of you have watched this, but I do enjoy uh, games, athletic competitions where athletes are pitted against each other. Right. And so in Titan Games is kind of interesting. If you're old enough, you might remember um, uh, what was it called? The, the gladiators. And so these these athletes, they have physical contests where they it's not just like running a race, but they actually have to do something physical against each other. And to be honest, I like these kinds of shows. I like watching American Ninja Warriors. I like watching Spartan. I, I like watching all of these type of shows where athletes are pitted against one another. But the real reason I like Titans is I am a huge fan of The Rock, otherwise known as Maui. And so anyways, uh, these, these challengers, they, they go up against each other. And one thing that the TV producer does is they give us the backstory for each of these athletes. So uh, before they compete, the athletes will, will be interviewed and they'll say, you know, uh, as, a, as a child, I was always the fittest person in my class. And I won all these athletic endeavors. I've won every single race that I've ever been in. Uh, my entire family are all Olympians, and that's why I am uh, the qualified to be a Titan. And so in some ways, right, I, I think the gospel uh, writer Luke does something similar for us as we look at this passage for today. Because the passage we're going to be looking at today, Jesus is about to face his first big challenge. That is the temptation of Jesus Christ. And it, it's coming against the biggest enemy. Right. He, he's going against Satan himself. And so Luke actually begins a temptation a few verses before uh, in chapter three. At the end of chapter three, we have John the Baptist. We remember John the Baptist. He's a cousin of Jesus. But God prepared John the Baptist to prepare the way for Jesus. And so John the Baptist is out in the wilderness. He's baptizing people. He's telling everyone, hey, guys, we need to turn away from our wicked ways. We need to repent. We need to turn away from the forms of religiosity to true religion. We need to prepare ourselves for the coming Messiah. And along comes Jesus asking John to baptize him. Now, here, here's an interesting question at the end of Luke chapter 3. Why does Jesus need to be baptized? Right? What exactly is Jesus getting baptized? Well, I mean, he doesn't need to repent. He hasn't sinned. Right? There's no repentance on his part. The reason Jesus needs to get baptized is because he is identifying, baptism here is identifying with humanity. He's saying, I am one of you. I'm representing all of humanity. And repentance here doesn't mean I'm turning away from sin. It's saying, I am full-hearted, wholeheartedly going to obey God. I am going to follow God. And when he was baptized, it was to do the things that God wanted him to do. Now, notice what happens when John the Baptist baptizes Jesus. We don't have the same exchange that we have in the other Gospels. But when John the Baptist baptizes Jesus, God, out of heaven, declares, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice comes from heaven saying, You are my beloved Son with you. I am well pleased. 
It's an amazing thing. God is not talking to all the people watching. God is not talking to the audience. God is not talking to the observer. God is speaking directly to his son, saying, I am well pleased with you. You are my beloved. And so this very first act that Jesus does in getting baptized which gives us, in some sense, his first credential. Luke says, Jesus is ready to face the biggest enemy of all time because he's the son of God. His first credential, Jesus is ready to face the enemy of all time because he is the son of God. Now, immediately after this, Luke does something that is very odd. And whenever in scripture we come to a passage that, that looks out of place, we as readers, we, we need to pause. We say, huh, I don't understand why Luke would do this or why Luke would write this or why Luke would say this. We need to pause and say, God, why did you, by your Holy Spirit's inspiration, put this particular passage where it is? And so Luke, right after the baptism of Jesus, he decides to list the genealogy of Jesus. And I'll admit, Myself, uh, sometimes when I get to these genealogies, I'm thinking, well, it's kind of boring, right? Like, wh why do I really care? Why do I really need to know all these different names of all these different grandfathers and great grandfathers? It's like when my family gets together with other people and, you know, we're at a family event, a wedding or whatnot. And they're like, Dean, you know, this is your grandfather's, you know, cousin's niece's uh, next door neighbor's son. Don't you remember them? I'm like, I have no idea who they are. Right. But the truth is, the truth is, actually, Asian culture is a lot more similar to Middle Eastern culture than, than Western culture is. And where you come from, who you've come from, is extremely important. It gives you credibility. It gives you standing. It gives you legitimacy in society. And it connects you with people so that people know uh, who you are. In, in fact, uh, giving the genealogy, this is like an ancient form of LinkedIn, right? It, it gives all the credential. Just as an aside, I just want to share this. Uh, this actually happened to me. My parents were at a friend's house uh, for dinner, and they were talking with a person next to them. And, uh, you know, they, they've never met before. And turns out, they had the same last name. They, the other family translated it differently in English, but uh, in Chinese, it's the same last name. So they're talking, that's kind of interesting. Not that many people have the same exact last name, the same way you write it. Where are you, where's your family from? They're like, oh my goodness, we're from the same province and we're from the same village. Oh my goodness. And so turns out that family, their daughter went to high school with me at our graduation uh, they brought along their father who had this long scroll of their, of their family tree. And he's like, this is where you guys fit in. And we had never met this family. And we're, we're actually not that far, you know, far apart, far removed from this family. But because of that, we got invited to their daughter's wedding because we were connected to them. Somehow we received the benefits of being a part of that family. And so, well, Luke gives us a genealogy, but his genealogy is a little bit different from Matthew's genealogy. For example, in Luke's ge genealogy, he begins with Jesus and he moves from Jesus. He goes all the way backwards. Matthew actually goes the other way. Right. And actually, the people are a little bit different. Scholars uh, tell us it's because one goes through the, the line of uh, Joseph, one goes through the line of Mary. Well, the second thing is. In Luke's genealogy, if we keep on reading till the end of Luke chapter 3, it says the son of Enos, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. Luke doesn't stop with Abraham. Luke brings Jesus all the way back to creation, all the way back to Adam. And it, it is so important. Why, why he does this, right? We, we, we read through the genealogy and there's some names that we recognize, Arubabal and David and Boaz. But when we get to Adam, Luke is setting us up for what's going to come for, for two reasons. The first is he wants us to know not only is Jesus the son of God, but he's also the son of Adam. He's not only fully God, but he's fully human as well. But the second reason that Luke is doing this is he's now going to put Jesus against all of mankind, right? Where mankind was tempted, 
Jesus will be tempted in a similar way. And so today we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 4. If you haven't turned already there, uh, please do so. Luke chapter 4, we're beginning in verse 1. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil, and he ate nothing during those days. And when they were ended, he was hungry. Now, this is a passage I think many of us we've heard before, whether it's in Sunday school or it's in VBS, or maybe you've heard a message before. And you're like, yeah, yeah, I know Jesus was tempted in the desert. And every time Jesus was tempted in the desert, you know, he responded with scripture, right? It is written, it is written, it is said. You know, oftentimes when, when pastors, myself included, when we, when we come to this passage, the lesson that we all like to take away from this is this is how you overcome temptation, right? You, you read more scripture, you, you, you memorize more scripture. And oftentimes, right, like the, the passage becomes really like, well, we got to put on the full armor of God. We got we to gotta put on the, the, the shield of faith and we got to put on the, the helmet of salvation. But the most important one is we got to take on the word of the spirit, uh, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And so when we look at this passage, a lot of times we think what we need to do, right? What we need to do is memorize God's word. And that's how we're going to overcome temptation. What we need to do is hide God's word in my heart. And that's how we're, we're, we're going to overcome temptation. So, for example, let's say this morning you didn't want to wake up or you don't want to wake up to go to work or you don't want to wake up to go to school. And you're just lying in bed and you're like, oh, my goodness, this bed is so warm. I just want to stay here a little bit. And all of a sudden, a little voice inside of your head says, how long will you lie there, oh sluggard? When will you arise from your sleep? Right? Uh, and you're thinking, oh, no, uh, scripture is oh, helping me overcome temptation. Uh, the passage goes on to say a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands and poverty will come upon you. And just like that, you jump up and you overcome temptation. And, and sometimes that's how we we think of this passage. Maybe it's like this. You're driving on the freeway and, you know, uh, you know, your car says it could go 140 miles an hour, but you've only brought it up to 70. And, you know, nobody's on the freeway now because everyone's sheltering in place. So you're out there, you're thinking, huh, maybe I should just test out my car, see if it's real advertising. So you're hitting 60 and then you're hitting 70 and then you're hitting 80. And all of a sudden, another verse comes to your mind. And it says, again, I saw that under the sun, the race is not to the swift nor the battle to the strong. And you're like, oh, no, uh, I need to slow down. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for, for helping me overcome the temptation of speeding. Or maybe for some of us, you know, uh, we have nothing else to do. So we're just binge eating and, and we're tempted by like donuts and we're tempted by, by carbs and we're tempted by all these different things. And we're like, I just want to eat more and more. And I just love to eat. And all of a sudden, this passage from Judges comes where Ehud comes and he goes and he stabs the king with his left hand with a sword. And the scripture tells us the sword went into him and the fat closed over the blade. And he it, the sword did not come out and we're like, oh, I don't want to be like that king. I need to pass on this donut. And sometimes we think that uh, we need to overcome temptation just simply by reciting uh, Bible verses or memorizing Bible verses. Now, don't get me wrong. I absolutely believe in the power of scripture. And I believe that there's power when we hide God's word in our heart and the Holy Spirit does something with us and reminds us and guides us in all truth, and uses scripture to grow us, to resist temptation. I believe that God's word is a source of life for us as believers. But here's what I think we get wrong about this passage. Right? Because a lot of times we look at this passage and we think, how can I overcome temptation? But the, you know, the truth is this passage is not about us. The passage is not a tutorial on how to overcome temptation. This passage is about Jesus and how Jesus overcame temptation. It's not about here's these three steps to overcome temptation. It's here's the person who does it. 
And Luke doesn't tell us this story primarily just to give us a tutorial on how to overcome temptation, but rather he expands on the person of Jesus Christ. So I want to take a look at the, the types of temptation Jesus faces and how he responds to them. And if you've ever learned how to study the Bible, what, I, what I'll be doing here is we're just going to make observations. We're going to look at this passage. We're going to say, what is the context here? And what, what, what can we learn? All three of the passages that Jesus quotes actually comes from Deuteronomy, which literally means the second law, the, the second writing of the law. It's written during a time when Moses was leading the people out of Egypt, and they were in the desert for 40 years. Right? Now notice the, the similarities, 40 days, 40 years, they're in the desert, they're in the wilderness for 40 years. And during this time, God was providing for them. God was uh, giving them food to eat and water to drink, and their shoes never uh, broke down. And, and God just kept on going before them. But during this time, it was an inc incredible time of testing and of trials uh, for the nation of Israel. And Satan tempts Jesus and says to Jesus, you must be hungry, Jesus. Why don't you just, you know, change some of these rocks into bread? Now, imagine not eating for 40 days. Imagine not eating for one meal, really. Uh, but imagine you went for 40 days. There's a group of our church leaders. We, we recently studied uh, the spiritual discipline of fasting. And part of the, the study of fasting is we wanted to practice. And so uh, most of us, we, we fasted for a meal. Some of us actually fasted for an extended period of time. It is really hard to fast. Right. Like, you know, I don't mind if I skip a meal here or there. It, it, it never really bothers me. But when I deliberately know I'm not eating, I, you know, the thing that I can't stop thinking about is food. It is really hard. And imagine if you're out in the desert for 40 days, not eating anything that, that that's a month and a half. And on top of that, here's something that I, I, I found very interesting. God nowhere in scripture has ever commanded anyone not to turn rock into bread, right? Now, when we think about this similarity, we go all the way back to Adam and in the creation story, when Satan comes to Adam and Eve and says, hey, why don't you eat this fruit? But we know at least in that story that God said, you can eat everything in this, in this garden except for this fruit. But as far as we know, nowhere in scripture, God never instructed Jesus, never turn a rock into bread for you to eat. Right? He, Jesus had no prohibition. I, I wonder, you know, what you would do, what I would do. I was like, ah, the Bible doesn't say we can't. Well, maybe. It would have been so easy for Jesus to do this. But notice his response. Jesus answers to him, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. Immediately, the reader would be alerted to two things. Right? The first is the story in the garden when God says to Adam, you can eat whatever you want except for this fruit. And when Satan comes along and tempts Adam and says, Adam, why don't you eat this? Adam eats. Now in the wilderness, it's not a garden. It's like the opposite of a garden, right? And there's no prohibition, but there's no food. And Satan comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, why don't you eat this bread? Jesus refuses and succeed, which brings me uh, to, to one of the points here where Adam failed, Jesus succeeded. Where Adam and Eve failed to obey God and they succumbed to the temptation of Satan, Jesus overcame and obeyed his heavenly father. And notice where this passage that he quotes comes from. It actually comes from a passage in Exodus 16. We read it not that long ago, really. Uh, the nation of Israel had just left Egypt, and they're about to go uh, into the promised land. And they're, they're out there for, for just a little bit. And all of a sudden, the people, they, they start complaining to Moses. We know when they left Egypt, they brought all of their flock, all of their herds, because theirs was protected by God, right? All the Egyptians were killed, but theirs was protected by God. And so they had all this flock, all this herd, but they start complaining to Moses, Moses, I'm so hungry. There's nothing to eat. I'm starving. Oh, Moses, why did you bring us out here? Back in Egypt, at least we had pots and pots and pots of food. 
and, and now we have nothing. Did you bring us out here so that we could die, so that you could kill us? And despite all of their complaints and all of their accusation, God feeds them with this heavenly bread called manna. And for 40 years, they had bread. But the lesson, and the quote comes from Deuteronomy 8, the lesson is, will you trust God for all of your needs? Or will you complain and question the goodness of God. And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. And the lesson for the nation of Israel is God will provide for you. Will you depend on him or will you depend on yourself? And here Luke sets up the nation of Israel against Jesus. And Luke tells us not only where Adam failed, Jesus succeeded, but he also tells us where Israel failed, Jesus succeeded. Where Adam failed, Jesus overcame. And where Israel failed, Jesus overcame. Well, Luke goes on to the second temptation and Satan brings him up to a point on a mountain and, and scripture tells us the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdom of the world in a moment of time, just like right in before him. He's like, look, and you could see everything. To you, I will give all this authority and their glory for it has been delivered to me and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Now, Jesus, being fully God, knew exactly what awaited him. He knew that he would be tortured. He knew that he would be ridiculed. He knew that he would be executed. He knew that his friends and his family would, would suffer greatly, both physically and emotionally, he knows the humiliation and he knows in the end he wins. And so here Satan is saying, well, you know, just worship me and all that. We, we could skip over all that. No pain, no, no, no suffering, no humiliation, no rejection. Just, just worship me. Just, just take a knee. All right. And all this can be yours. And notice what Jesus says. And Jesus answered him. Well, it is written you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And what Jesus here is doing, what he's doing here is he's combining the first two commandments together uh, from Deuteronomy chapter 6. It is the Lord your God, you shall fear him, you shall serve, and by his name you shall swear. And what he's doing is he's reminding us, He's hearkening back to the time, another point in Israel's uh, history of Israel's failure, where the nation of God is leaving uh, Egypt. And God says to Moses, Moses, come up to this mountain. I'm going to give you some laws. And these laws are not meant to restrict you. They're not meant to confine you. They're meant to bless you and to allow you to thrive and to be a blessing to the whole world. And so Moses goes up on this mountain and he gets these laws on this tablet and God's writing and talking to him and says, this is how you should treat one another. This is how you should love one another. This is how you should treat the foreigners and the women and the slaves and all these different things. And Moses, he's coming down. He's excited. He's going to tell all his friends, all the people. He's, you know, not only has God done all this miracle for us, I just met with God and he's given us these great rules. He's given us this great society that we could uh, build around, that we could receive his blessings. And what, what does he find when he gets down the mountain? The people had already grown impatient. The people said, Moses is taking too long. We can't wait for him any longer. Let's just, let, let, let's just make our own God. Okay, everybody give me your rings. Give me your jewelry. We'll melt it down. We'll make a cow. Let, let's worship this. Moses comes down and to his absolute horror, he sees his people not able to wait upon God but worshiping a golden cow, 
right? And Moses gets so mad, he destroys this tablet. He just throws it down and breaks, and God has to make him another set of uh, laws. And Luke here is reminding us as listeners where Israel failed once again in faithful worship of God. Where Israel failed to, to just wait upon God, even for a short period of time. Where Israel failed to, to worship God alone, Jesus succeeded. Where Adam failed to obey God fully, Jesus succeeded. Where Israel failed to depend on God, Jesus succeeded. Where the nation failed to worship God alone, Jesus succeeded. You see, this is, this is the story that Luke is trying to, to weave for us. Not, not so much recite scripture when you're tempted, though there's power. But rather, where all these people have failed, there's one that has succeeded. Let's look at the next temptation. Saying now he takes him to Jerusalem to the to pinnacle of the temple. We don't know exactly where it is, but it's a high point. He says, listen, Jesus, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you. And on their hands, they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against the stone. Now, Satan is getting clever. He's saying, if you are the son of God, just jump down. It's, it's just 80 feet. What's the big deal? The Bible says, Jesus, angels will catch you and your heel will not be struck. And, and just as an aside, right? Don't be naive and think Satan doesn't know scripture. Satan knows scripture and Satan can twist scripture and use scripture to his own purposes. And that's why it is so important for us to study scripture and to understand scripture. And I know for many of us, we're like, ah, it's just another thing I need to read. But knowing scripture is how we know the heart of God. That's why we allow the Holy Spirit to use the scripture that, that is in place in us. And so when someone comes along and says, well, you know, this understanding of scripture, you know, really you should, you should jump off a building. We're like, no, 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 that's not what it means. But what does Jesus say? And Jesus answers him. He says, it is, uh, it is said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Now, it's very interesting because he's quoting from Deuteronomy 6, 16 here. It says, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test as you tested him at Masa. And so when the listeners heard him say this passage, and when you and I, we hear him say, quote this verse, our minds should immediately go back to Exodus 17. And what exactly happened at Exodus 17? This is right after the whole manna debacle, right? Uh, the people are still walking. God's been providing them all this wonderful manna from heaven and quail. And they're still, they're still walking around in the desert. And what do they do? They complain, right? This is the God who like literally saved their people from the hands of Pharaoh. And they go to Moses. Like, we have no water. I'm so thirsty. We just want a little water to drink. How come you don't give us water? And, and just a chapter before, we see God had changed the bitter water to sweet. But now there's no bitter water to be had. And they're like, oh, my goodness, Moses, you're, you want us to die. Why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us? And so God tells Moses to strike the rock and water comes out of it. And that's how they call the place Masa because they tested God. And Jesus was also out in the wilderness. And Jesus, he experienced uh, the, the affirmation from God. But for 40 days, it was nothing in the wilderness, nothing but fasting. Right? For the nation of Israel, at least they had the food and they had the water. Uh, they still failed to trust in the character of God, the faithfulness of God, the provision of God, the goodness of God. But Jesus, he succeeded by trusting that God was who he said he was, and he was who God said he was, his beloved, with whom he was well pleased. And once again, Luke tells us the story, not to give us a tutorial on how to overcome temptation, but to remind us where all of humanity has failed, Adam, 
the nation of Israel, David, Paul, all these great people of faith, there's one person that has overcome. His name is Jesus. I wonder who amongst us have not struggled with temptation before, whether it's with pride or with lust or with cheating or jealousy or anger or bitterness. Maybe we also struggle with worshiping other idols. We, we don't have little golden calves, but we worship our jobs or we worship a dream. We worship our children. We worship materials. We worship grades or we worship politics. And it doesn't matter how strong you are, how mature you are, how knowledgeable you are, how old you are. At some point, we will all be tempted. And at some point, we will all fall. And some of us say, well, it's not really, it's not really fair because Jesus is Jesus and he's God's own son. He's so much stronger than us. But the truth is, the stronger you are, the more intense the temptation, right? Because you're, you're standing up under that temptation, right? If I were to lift a 500 pound weight and I, and I get it for half a second, and that's very different from a strong man who's holding it above his head for 30 seconds. And Jesus dealt with temptation that is far more challenging or difficult or intense than you or I would ever face. Notice how Luke finishes this pericope, the story. When the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. You know, the story's not over for Jesus. The temptation ended for now, but Jesus would face much more. Remember at the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus is just sweating drops of blood. Or, or when, when he's on the cross, the criminal uses the same exact word. If you are the son of God, take yourself down from here. Don't you think it would have been so easy for Jesus to say, well, I'll show you. Question me one more. I, you know, uh, sure, I'll take myself down from the cross and then you'll be sorry. But the lesson that Luke wants us to know is this. For the first time in all of human history, since the creation of the world, a son of Adam has mounted a successful defense against the temptations of Satan. For the first time in all of human history, a person has overcome Satan. Where Adam has failed, where, where Israel has failed, where the disciples have failed, where you and I, we have failed. Luke is yelling out at the top of his voice, but Jesus succeeded. Jesus has overcome. And where we have failed in our, in our pride or selfishness or questioning God's character or greed or bitterness or lying or faithlessness, where all of humanity has failed, there is one person, a son of Adam and a son of God, who is able to successfully defeat temptation. And I want us to know it's so important, brothers, sisters, to read our Bibles, to memorize scripture, to hide God's word in our heart, because the Holy Spirit does use that. And that's how we grow more and more in Christ's likeness. But the lesson here is we don't defeat temptation by trying harder. We don't defeat temptation by living a perfect life. We don't defeat temptation by knowing more scripture, by being more mature. We don't defeat temptation by having more spiritual disciplines or having more accountability. We defeat temptation when we put our faith in Jesus Christ. When we put our hope, when we put our trust, when we put our life in the one who has overcome temptation. And, and when we are tempted now, it's not about gutting it through. It's not about working harder. It's not about trying more. It's not about having barriers or accountability. But when we are tempted now, we return to the one who has overcome. And we say, help me. I need your grace. I need your mercy. Because only one has overcome temptation. His name is Jesus. The author of Hebrew reminds us, 
For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Christians, I know we all struggle with temptation, every single one of us. And some of us here, we feel beaten. We feel defeated and we feel like there's no hope, but there is hope, friends. If you have put your faith in Jesus Christ and you have given your life over to Jesus Christ, it doesn't mean you won't be tempted. You will be tempted. In fact, you'll probably be tempted even more. But when you are tempted, go to the one who has already overcome and say, Jesus, I need help. And trust that he will provide a way out in every single temptation. I want to end uh, this message uh, before we go into time of communion with one of my favorite songs of all time. In the Sunday school, actually, a couple weeks ago, one of the icebreaker questions is, you know, share one of your favorite songs. And one of mine is written by a man uh, named Rich Mullins. He died much too early, uh, but he's a beautiful, uh, poetic songwriter. One day in a concert, he confessed to uh, the, the audience how he struggled with the temptation of watching pornography, uh, oftentimes when he's traveling alone. So one of his spiritual mentors told him, was like, well, Rich, don't, don't travel alone. And so from that point on, he always had a friend with him uh, whenever he traveled, whenever he toured uh, to perform. Well, on one trip, he was in Amsterdam and he was near its infamous red light district. And Rich Mullins said he was hoping his friend would fall fast asleep and start snoring. Uh, and he actually says, I thought uh, maybe it would be fun to take a walk and be tempted. Well, he waited until five o'clock in the morning for his friend to fall asleep and start snoring, but he never did. And it's during this time of intense temptation and struggle, Mullins picked up a notebook and wrote the words to this song, Hold Me Jesus. Let me just read this because I think it so captures the idea that Luke is trying to give us. And I wake up in the night and I feel the dark. It's so hot inside my soul. I swear there must be blisters on my heart. So hold me, Jesus, because I'm, I'm shaking like a leaf. You have been the king of my glory. Won't you be my prince of peace? Friends, when you face temptation, and you will, Remember that you are held closely by the one who has overcome. You are held in his arms. You are loved deeply and greatly by Jesus Christ, who has already defeated sin and who has already defeated Satan. So when you are tempted, remember that you're being held by your Savior, Jesus Christ, and turn to him and say, Lord Jesus, won't you hold me? And won't you help me? Won't you give me grace to make it through this night? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we, we are grateful that we have a Savior that, that isn't simply giving us a pattern on how to live because there's no way we would live like your son, Jesus Christ. But because of him, we could be hidden in his life. Because of him, um, we could receive the victory that he has achieved on our behalf. I pray especially for those of us in our church family who struggles actively. We all do. Father, remind us how deeply we are loved by you and how we are held closely to you and how you offer grace and mercy whenever we go through temptations of, of any kind. And Father, as we come into a time of communion and we remember what you have done for us on the cross, would you also remind us the victory that we have over sin, even in our present life right now? As we take the communion, God, would you remind us of this reality? We pray these things in your son's name. Amen. Well, we now come to a time of communion. Communion, once again, is a time where we as followers of Jesus Christ 
are able to be reminded that there is a common union that not only do we have with one another, but that we have with Jesus Christ. So if you have been baptized and you are a believer, and if you have already prepared the elements, we ask that you take the elements right now and get it ready. I'm going to read this passage. And I'm going to pray. And when you're ready, you could all take the elements together. For I receive from the Lord what I also deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, he took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For often, as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Heavenly Father, we are grateful, Lord, that you sent your son. We could not save ourselves. Not a single one of us could live a life where we would overcome temptation, we would overcome sin. Only you. So we are thankful for your son, Jesus Christ, and we know the price he had to pay so that we could have eternal life and we could have forgiveness of sin. As we take these elements, Father, would you remind us of your great love for us? Would you remind us of the victory that we have in your son, Jesus Christ? And would you allow us to live in that truth, in that reality, that we are not slaves to sin, but we are slaves to righteousness, your sons and your daughters. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Pray these things in your son's name. Amen. Drink and remember, he drank that 
hands cup that all may answer it to receive the life of God. So we share in this bread of life and we drink of his sacrifice as a sign of our bonds of grace around the table of the King. And so with thankfulness and faith we rise to to remember our call to follow in the steps of Christ as his body here on earth. And as we share in his suffering, we proclaim Christ will come again and will join in the feast of heaven around the table of the king Oh, 
Countless power running more By your blood I come Welcome that your own Into the arms of majesty This is the art of celebration free from condemnation. Oh, praise the one, praise the one who made it into all my sin. This is the God of celebration. Oh, we were free from Give you glory. 
Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. Hey, have a great week, guys. Uh, stick around and you can listen to the Rich Mullen songs that I referenced in the, the message uh, right after this live or after the service ends. Have a great week.